This is the story of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, kingdom builder, healer. He is the King of glory. He is the resurrecting Savior. They expected a conqueror, but instead they got a servant, crucified and lifted high. And the marks on his hands have just marked for salvation. I love to read a good story, and I bet you all do too. Give me a good short story, a soft blanket, a rainy day, and I am happy for hours. I love trying to figure out who all the characters are, what their problems happen to be, and how they resolve them. Sometimes I think about the story that I have read for weeks, months, and sometimes maybe even a whole year. Well, today's miracle story in the fast-paced gospel of Mark is one that totally surprised me. I've read it so many different times, but I didn't see some things that God had for me as it bubbled all up. We see Jesus doing what he loves best, interacting with the people. He's healing them physically and mentally, making them whole, and he is preparing them for the kingdom of God. Now we find him in a desolate place with a lot of people and what seems to be a really big problem. This little story is one of the 18 miracle stories in Mark. You've probably read the one in chapter 6, and yes, they are different. But in Mark, there are three types of healing stories, of miracles. Number one, there are exorcisms, then there are healings, and then there are nature miracles. And that's when Jesus goes beyond scientific laws of the earth to make something happen. This morning, we're going to delve into this little short story because as I prepared, I believe that God has a message for First Methodist Houston. So let's start out by meeting our characters. The main character is, of course, Jesus. The minor characters are his disciples and 4,000 other people. 4,000 other people? Well, I tried to figure out what 4,000 people would look like. This church will seat 1,300. So we basically would almost have to fill it up four times to get 4,000 people in here. But wait a minute. Scripture said there were 4,000 men. That doesn't include all of the women and the children that were likely there. So if that's the case, I believe we would have to fill this place up 16 times to get all of the people in one place. We'd have to do it at intervals. So scholars do say that with the men, the women, and the children, there were likely 16,000 people. And if we all wanted to be together at one time, we'd have to rent a stadium. Now, why in the world would 16,000 people follow Jesus to a very remote place? Why do people travel to Fatima, Portugal, or Lourdes, France, where our Catholic brothers and sisters say the Virgin Mary appeared and healed the children? Or why would we go on the Walk of St. James, El Camino de Santiago, where people claim miracles have happened? It's easy. Word travels fast. It did back then, and it travels fast today. Back in chapter 7 at the end, you read about the healing of the deaf man. Compassionate Jesus took his fingers, touched the man's tongue, 
touched the man's ears, and all of a sudden he could hear and he could talk. Scripture tells us that the people were amazed, and the word that they used in the Scripture was overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed when they saw this miracle. But if you go back to chapter 5, Jesus healed a demoniac, a man that was filled with demons. He lived up in the tombs, and Scripture says he yelled and shrieked and hollered day in and day out. And he took stones and cut himself. Jesus went to him, and he fell down. And Jesus healed him, took the swine, the pigs, the demons were in the pigs, and they ran down the hill into the water. All of a sudden, he's sitting there in his right mind, thinking, oh my goodness, I was just healed. Jesus, Jesus, let me come with you. And Jesus said, no. You go back to your village and you tell everybody that the Lord has healed you and made you whole, that he had mercy up on you. And you know what? He did just that. He went back and told everybody, and now Jesus is surrounded by droves of people. And maybe they're thinking, maybe Jesus will heal me too. Isn't it interesting what one man or one woman can do for Christ? As I thought about my sermon, I started thinking about Billy Graham. And people have told me there's a write-up about him today in the Chronicle. He is 90, almost 99 years old. He has written 33 books, and the last one, which I think he wrote five years ago, was called Nearing Home. I highly recommend it. He has spoken to over 215 million people in 183 countries or territories. His call to salvation, his call to repentance has brought probably millions to Jesus Christ. If you're a part of the older generation, the hymn, Just As I Am, is echoing in your mind, and that distinctive <clears throat> voice of his, we can hear it all over. His ministry is continuing through his children, Anne Graham Lotz and Franklin Graham. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when Billy Graham steps into heaven? Think of the thousands, if not millions, of people that will come out to greet him, many of them saying, thank you so much for what you did, that you told me about Jesus. I think the day that he steps into heaven, there's going to be a really big party. Now, there's another man who's had a great influence in our world, and he is not as well known. As a matter of fact, um, he is from the country of England, and he was a stockbroker there as a young man. His name is Sir Nicholas Winton, and he is now my new hero. He was the parents of German immigrants who turned Christian. And when he was young and working, someone said, the Nazi occupation of Germany is imminent, and there are lots of children in the refugee camps who are going to perish if we do not do something. So Sir Nicholas took his own money arrange for trains to take the children out of Europe over into Britain and Sweden, the only two countries that would take them. So using his own money, 669 children 
were brought to safety. Can you imagine being their parents and loading up your children on a train knowing you're never going to see them again? And can you imagine the wide-eyed little children on the train looking out, thinking, wow, I get to ride a train, not knowing exactly what was happening, but they were about to have a new lease on life. Well, one day his wife was up in the attic and she was searching through things and she found a scrapbook and a satchel full of papers. And like any good wife, she went downstairs and said, Nikki, that's his nickname, what are these? And he told her the whole story. He had never told anyone what he had done. Well, the story got out, of course. He was knighted by uh, Queen Elizabeth in 2003. And I'm about to show you a video of Sir Nicholas. He is very humble. He's honored one night in a big auditorium like this. It's full of people. The hostess of this evening is reading off one of the children's name. What Sir Nicholas doesn't know is she is sitting right beside him. She's a grandmother now, but she is one of the children that Sir Nicholas saved. All the letters. But back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Diamant, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. <laughs> and it was just so wonderful, so terribly, terribly touching. Is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? Right now, there are over 6,000 descendants of Nikki's kids, and that number is increasing yearly. They owe their lives to the very one man who stumbled in his faith because of some of the atrocities he saw, but he stepped out with God to make a huge impact. I wonder what would happen at First Methodist Houston if we had the courage to tell everyone, like Billy Graham, what Jesus has done in our lives. Or I wonder if we had the courage today to say in this service, Jesus, I'm here. I'll help you with one of those big projects. I would love to be your helper. You know what? It would be like ripples on a pond. They keep going and going and going, and only Jesus knows when they will end. One man making a huge difference for the kingdom. So we're back in our story again, and we see men and women sitting there, and we see babies crying and toddlers running around, and they may look just like they do in this Sermon on the Mount window, Look at all the people gathered around listening to Jesus. But there's a big problem, and it's arrived quickly, and they have had no food for three days. Three days with no food? Have you ever gone three days with no food? 
Well, what happens in three days? I researched it. Your body starts going into starvation mode on day three, and your body begins to pull all the nutrients from your other organs to uh, fuel your brain. And so you grow weaker and weaker, and that depends on how much extra fat you have on your body and if you had water. I determined I could make it about four or five days with what I have on my body. But think of the older people there, how fragile they were, ones that wanted healing, ones that had tiny babies that were hungry. Things aren't looking very good in this story. Yes, people brought food along with them. That was the, what they did in that society. But it was almost gone. And having no food not only makes you physically weak, but it can affect you emotionally. In this wonderful book, Sleeping with Bread, it tells the story of children during World War II who were put in refugee camps, the lucky ones. They did have a bed and they were fed some, but they could not settle them down at night. Finally, somebody came up with the idea to let each child hold one piece of bread all night long. You know what? They went straight to sleep because they thought, today I ate, tomorrow I will eat too. I didn't really think much about that story until Kristen Jones sent a bunch of us to Acuna, Mexico. We were working in an orphanage there. We had been painting and painting away when the owners that night crashed into our compound with all these children and said, we need to spend the night here. We have a problem. One of the grandmothers in the community wanted to kidnap one of the six-year-old children to sell him for body parts. I kid you not, and that is what she was trying to do. So they brought all of the children into the place where we're staying, and one by one by one, they went over to a big bowl of cereal bars. They grabbed some. They didn't think we were looking. They put them inside their shirt. They put them in their pockets. And that night, we went in and checked their rooms. And yes, they were under their pillows. We will eat today, and we will eat again tomorrow. Well, as we say, going without food will make anyone anxious. Anyone anxious. It makes us anxious. And Jesus knew this, so he called the disciples together and said, I have compassion on these people. He knew that if he did not feed them, they would collapse on the long journey home. Author Thomas Wright says this, Confront our Jesus with a lost soul or a tired body or a hungry body, and his first instinct is to help. Is that your first instinct, to help? Do you allow yourself to be the hands and feet of Christ, or do you kind of look at the person next to you and think, oh, they'll take care of it? William Barclay, one of the great commentators, was on a way to a conference center, and the road to it was dangerous. A fellow attendee said, whoa, that was a dangerous road. I saw a wreck on the way. And Barclay said, did you stop and help? He said, why would I get mixed up in something like that? His wonderful words were, it's human to want to avoid the trouble of giving help, but it's divine to have so much compassion that we're compelled to help. Human not to, divine to reach out and help. Well, the hungry crowd is restless, and Jesus huddles with his disciples. They were in such a remote area that the disciples looked at him and said, Jesus, where in the world are we going to get any food to feed these people? 
It's not like today where you have Burger King, Chick-fil-A, and McDonald's at every corner. And even if they did, this is a little strange, but even if they did, can you imagine the cook staff when they heard the order, I need 4,000 Big Macs, 4,000 fries, and I'll be back in a few minutes later to get 12,000 more. We in America take the abundance of food for granted. There was a priest that came to the United States to study. He was from Africa. And when he went back, the people gathered around him and they wanted to know about the Americans. He goes, do they eat as much as we do? <clears throat> and he said, they don't eat like we do because we have a big hunt and then we eat and eat and eat. He said, in America, they eat all the time. They expect food to be provided the instant they are hungry. Fast food on demand is a hallmark of America. Something to think about. Well, the only thing they had on demand were seven loaves, look at the altar, and a few fish. That was all that they had. And as we think about that, we think, hmm, would we be willing to go away three days without any fast food to meet with Jesus and talk with him? Some of our staff goes to the Villa de Mattel, and there's no fast food there. It's all in silence. But you know who's there? It's Jesus and he almost welcomes you at the door. Come and spend some time with me and enter in this great story. And what about all the resources we have at our fingertips? I mean, are we so moved by compassion that we would be willing to maybe go with less and hand some other to other people? Well, Jesus had a plan all along the problem is about to be solved. He tells them, go out, round up any leftovers you find and bring them to me. And they did it. They went out and did it. And Jesus prayed to God over it and a miracle happened. And they ate until they were satisfied. And then he went down and they got a few fish. They gathered them all up. Jesus prayed over them. A miracle happened. And guess what? Tummies are full of fish sandwiches. But don't miss this. Jesus made the disciples a part of the miracle. They go and gather the bread and the fish. Jesus blesses it and it multiplies. They distribute it and pick up the leftovers seven basketfuls of broken pieces. What was impossible became possible. Isn't it wonderful about a miracle like this and joining with Jesus? I know our Stephen ministers can tell you about miracles that they have seen in their own lives with broken people. We need to ask ourselves, am I willing to let Jesus make me a part of a miracle for another person? It doesn't make any difference what you have. Your resources may be limited, but with God, the impossible can happen. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. You know, some people carry, for when it happens on demand, they carry little McDonald's cars. Ruthie Estes does that in her purse. And when Jesus says or sends somebody to her, she pulls out a McDonald's card. What would happen if you took your fast food money for a month, put it in an envelope, and brought it to this church marked feed the poor. How much would that be? It would vary for each and every family. Or what if you took your fast food money and then just used it on Jesus' command? Jesus would say, would you feed this person today? And you reach in your pocket 
and you have that money. I had an opportunity to be a part of a miracle, and I am so grateful. I will not forget it until I have no breath. I got a call from a young man in Haiti, and he goes, Miss Ann, I want to start a business. Well, that's impossible. You just don't get a lot of money to start a business. And so I kept thinking, who can I ask to fund this? And then one day I said to God, if I had the extra resources, God, I would take care of it. By noon, I had the money, the exact amount that he needed. I was so shocked I could not even get out of my car. I sat in the parking lot thinking, what just happened? But I sent it on to Haiti joyfully, and I have a picture of the young man. His name is Joseph. They call him Roro. I have a picture of him today for you, and I have a picture of his business. It's little, but it's a mansion to him, and there's a 27-year-old in Haiti who is absolutely so excited, maybe watching today. He has a new lease on life, and he can feed his family. And so we pause today at this little miracle story so God could remind us all, every one of us, we pause to look and see what one man, one woman, or even one child can do for Christ. Like the man in the tombs, like Billy Graham, or like Sir Nicholas, we can make a huge difference. And then we pause because God still works miracles. And if you're willing, he will come to you and let you join in a miracle. Tom Wright says, the closer we get to Jesus, the more likely he will call us to share in his work of compassion, healing, feeding, and bringing his kingdom to an ever-widening circle. Did you hear that? The closer we get to Jesus, the more likely he's going to call on us. Does that scare you to death? Or does that excite you? I hope you're so close to Jesus that that excites you because Jesus has a lot of plans for a lot of people and he needs willing helpers. Our resources may be limited, but give them to Jesus anyway. Nothing is impossible. He still works miracles today. He's going to work them in the future. Will you join him in making a miracle happen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, dear God, we thank you so much for this little story in the middle of Mark that encourages us so much to step out as one man, one woman, or one child to make a difference. And Lord, we're willing today to join you in a miracle. You know what it is. May we be so close to you that we make miracles happen over and over for people in need. And now would you join me in the prayer that our Lord taught us to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.